I'm very excited to have Dr. Julie Shablitsky here today. She's the Chief Archaeologist at the Maryland Department of Transportation. She's a professor at two universities, and she's written several books, including Archaeology of the War of 1812 and Box Office Archaeology, Refining Hollywood's Portrayal of the Past. And here we go with our interview. Okay. Uh, I want to thank you for coming here today. I uh, really appreciate it. And we're going to talk about archaeology and movies, something that's uh, very important to both of us. And uh, as I'm, I'm an also an archaeologist and a big movie fan, and I think you are too. Um, so could you start by just telling me a little bit about your archaeological background, which is really extensive? Yeah, I have been doing archaeology for over 30 years. And uh, my undergraduate and graduate work was um, in Minnesota and then later in Oregon. So I moved from the Midwest where I did a lot of um, archaeology in the National Park Service as an archaeological technician. And then I did my master's degree and PhD out in Oregon, out that direction. And so all throughout school, um, while I was going to school, I was working for any of the National Park Service, the U.S. Forest Service, and even uh, CRM firms. So I worked all over the place. And then once I graduated with my um, doctorate, I went ahead and took a position with the Oregon Department of Transportation as, their, as uh, one of their archaeologists. So that's where I was for a while. And then about 12 years ago, I, I went east and um, took a position uh, here in Maryland at the Department of Transportation. So I've been leading their cultural resources program uh, since then. Uh, but I also have academic positions at the University of Oregon as well as the University of Maryland where I do research and work with graduate students. Okay, so out in Oregon is where you started working with the boom towns and... Yeah, uh, so Oregon is kind of where the Wild West archaeology uh, work had started. So I had a lot of fun looking and exploring industrial archaeology sites, anything from logging camps to mining camps. And that's when it, came, when it came time to choose my my dissertation for my PhD, that's how I arrived upon um, the idea of doing something in a town like Virginia City, Nevada. Okay, and that led you eventually to Bonanza. Yes, Bonanza, and Bonanza was a little bit before my time. I'm going to get a disturbance here. Time too, but I caught the end of it, I guess. Yeah, so Bonanza was before my time, but everybody kind of knew about it, and when you go back and look at some of the old programs, you realize how simple the sets were, how basic the clothing was, and how everybody was very, very white, except for Hop Singh, the um, kind of token Chinese man who represented the diversity at the time. Right. They always wore the same color clothes to keep it simple and everything. Yeah. So, so, uh, mm -hmm. Go ahead. I was say, so back then, unlike today, where you have a more educated audience, uh, back 50, 60, 70 years ago, people weren't, I don't think, as um, as educated about how people dressed back then, what would have been appropriate for street scenes, uh, even the types of bottles and cups dining rooms would have been set with. That sort of, those sorts of details um, were never looked into or really worried about by the production team because, again, you have to worry about what you can get away with with your audience, and that was an easy thing not to worry about it. Right. And then we'll, I think we'll get back to that in a little more, but how that, how those details can lead to a, a better film product or a better movie product. And uh, so, um, so let's just jump right into that. I'm looking at the questions over here that, uh, how did, uh, how, how did you first start applying this to a film, to movies, your idea that about, uh, that led to the book, I guess is what I'm asking. How did it, uh, how did your idea kind of coalesce for the book? As an archeologist, I'm very much tuned into material culture. Uh, and as an historical archeologist, I recognize things in movie sets, table settings, I think is a perfect example, or in the background, a lamp or a lamp, lamp or uh, clothing. These sorts of things that um, communicate to me uh, a historical story in in my archaeological sites is something I can see in these movie sets, because as an archaeologist, when you when you pick up a, a ceramic shirt, for example, you're not just seeing 
you know, a broken thing, you're seeing the entire cup. Or when you see a bottle lip, you're not seeing just the bottle lip, you're seeing the entire bottle. So then as, as an archaeologist sitting back on my couch watching a movie or television, I'm always looking at what people are doing with those items uh, in historical scenes and documentaries. And I began to notice that um, there's discrepancy there. But to me, I think what the more important takeaway is, it's not just about the stuff or the material culture, but it's then it becomes about the people, right? Um, we're anthropologists. And, mm -hmm. and I began to then kind of not worry about how the table is set, if that's the right transfer print, or if they're using the right color bottle glass. I began to think about, well, who's on that set? How are the scenes being portrayed? I think a great example is if you look at any street scenes of Bonanza, you'll see a bunch of dudes running around, and there's no children, and there's very few women. And we know when we think about a busy street scene, um, there should be all sorts of people, shapes, sizes, ages, on the street to really communicate community. Right. And, and so that's, I think, the first thing you see in any Wild West film is that you just see that absence of diversity and sex and age and um, race. Okay. So uh, uh, just to jump in as an aside, you, you're aware that Ben, I think, had three wives and killed them all off on birth. Uh, they And then Joe, I, that's what ended the show is when little Joe's fifth fiance or something died because they were really good about killing off the women instantly mm -hmm. in that show. So uh, you put together a really uh, great bunch of people, Charlie Hecker and some of the other, Charlie Ewing, Russ Garonic, uh some of the underwater pirate guys. And uh, how did you assemble such a, a good group? Well, the authors came together as, as a session in, in the site for Silk Archaeology, one of their conferences. So uh, whenever you do an edited volume, that's kind of where you start, but it doesn't need to be where you end. A lot of times you can add people to that um, edited volume, or you can take some away if it doesn't make sense. And what I was really striving for was a compilation of different types of sites, underwater sites. Um, I wanted to also look at um, terrestrial sites. I wanted to look at the west. I wanted to look at the east. And I didn't necessarily need to even stick in, in the United States. So that's why we have some of the Viking, we have a Viking chapter in there to look at, um, you know, something else besides just American archaeology. So I was really trying to gather a group of people from diverse backgrounds, which have different perspectives about how they see and digest and um, process what they see on the television and how they reckon that with their own work in archaeology. Okay. Well, this may seem like a simple question to you, but you can help clarify it to us old men. Why is it so important that, uh, that the uh, community that you see visually reflects reality? I mean, what is it, does it, how does it help our modern society by seeing a realistic depictation? I think that human beings in general are very visual and I think that when you see something on television uh, even though you might be watching like a drama play out or a conversation happen or some action uh, you're also picking up different visual cues and you're becoming familiar with what is happening in front of you for example um, getting back to the Wild West if you have a conversation happening about, I don't like say, a mine, a mining site, and you have people talking, and it's just, you know, two white guys, that's, that's one thing. But if you see, for example, um, a conversation that includes someone that's Chinese or of African descent, you're actually having a more real conversation that's reflective of how things went down in the past. So um, Virginia City is a great example of where you had a very diverse global community uh, you had people there that were African American, that were uh, immigrants and migrants from from Boston, Massachusetts. You had Chinese coming from the from overseas. You had people from Jamaica. You had people from Germany, Ireland, uh, uh, England. So you have this really diverse group of people that come together, and that's really what these mining communities were, and that's really who we were and are today. And I think when you look back at the old films of the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, you're just not seeing that diversity for a couple reasons. One, I think that 
you're having people who are white producers and white executive directors creating these scenes. They're trying to tell a story to their audience being white people, and uh, they're not thinking about anyone else or anybody else that might not be them. So it's almost like this um, single dialogue that's happening. Okay. And it uh, it kind of reinforces that, like, uh, this white America, white Christian uh, people, because it was just, uh, like, the Tarzan character, Ben, taking care of everybody else's problems. Kind of like the yeah. great white father. And exactly. It, uh, so okay. even, like, you even think about, you've heard of the spaghetti westerns, because it was always a big joke that these wild west, you know, instead of having, you know, Native Americans... Um, playing Native Americans, you end up having these Italian uh, people playing Native Americans. When there were plenty of Native Americans out there who were probably willing and ready to take those acting jobs, um, those were bypass opportunities were not given. Instead, you know, you have your Italians in there playing a role and playing a community that they knew nothing about. I see. Like uh, John Ford, I guess. He uh, used uh, Nav Navajo when he was out in Monument Valley, but they were all in just background. They weren't, you know, none, uh, the were all Caucasian actors that were in costume. So kind of mm -hmm. the same thing. So mm -hmm. uh, what, um, what you, you did your War of 1812 book, and the, there's no good War of 1812 movies that maybe the Buccaneer with the, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank, uh, Moses, uh, NRA, <laughs> Charlton Heston. Okay. Charlton Heston. So, uh, uh, do, there's no real. Do you know of any uh, War of 1812 movies or anything like that? You know, I have not looked for them. I'm sure they exist out there in some way. I mean, War of 1812. That's always been kind of um, deemed the forgotten war. Uh -huh. It it just doesn't seem to resonate with um, the Americans and definitely not the British. Um, about what happened over here, because you know you hear about the Revol American Revolution, the Revolutionary War. Of course, that's you know where we were able to you know take our freedom from um, you know from Europe, from Great Britain, and we have it. Uh, and the War of 1812 was almost like a reminder that yeah, it's still ours, and we're still fighting for it. Uh, and then you have, of course, the next war that you really have is going to, at least for that we kind of talk about and celebrate would be. The American Civil War, um, the U United States Civil War. So, and that gets a lot of play. I mean, there's so much passion around the Civil War, and I think to a lot of people, it's it's su surprising. Um, so, but I mean, why would you? Anyway, I mean, I mean, now that I live here on the East Coast, uh, in fact, I just was on a, a location, um, Burkittsville, in Maryland, here, where there was a Civil War battle. And I went to the a, a place where they had one of the encampments, and it was a lookout. And it, there is something magical about the Civil War. I don't know what it is. I guess the the um, the the idea that you have brother against brother that is being fought on U.S. soil. Um, but for whatever reason, getting back to the War of 1812, we just mm -hmm. don't. It's just it's not one of those um, those those wars that really I think captures people's imaginations or resonates with them in any particular way. Okay. That's a great answer. Um, I was going to just, I'm thinking of some questions that, that are just coming up and how do you feel about, um, like his, um, revisionist history, like, uh, Abraham Lincoln vampire slayer or, or uh, that, uh, guns of the guns of the South when they're portrayed in movies and it's, got enough history in it to confuse people and then a lot of made up stuff yeah you know? and then one of my favorite ones is like drunk history is that when when people um you know they take comedians and they give them a lot they liquor them up and then they get to tell their own you know story about what history was like or what a story about about you know the abraham lincoln assassination and how it went down i think that in going through the process of looking at um how history is played out on the screen, how movie makers um, have actors play it out, what the backgrounds, the backdrops, the material culture, what that all looks like. I've kind of gotten over the fact that they're never going to get it right. They're never going to get it to the point where I, as a scholar of history, archaeology, is ever going to be completely happy. 
So I've kind of resigned myself to accepting that. And as such, when you have these like, you know, the Abraham Lincoln, you know, vampire slayer, or you have them, you know, the presence of zombies or whatever, I am completely okay with that. I don't think that I've kind of, I've just come to the conclusion that we shouldn't ever look at um, movies or television series as te- as great teachers. I mean, okay. but I think what's important to take away is that in the way that we can look at it from a different perspective is that these movies and television series and even, you know, Abraham Lincoln, you know, Vampire Slayer, these sorts of things can spark an interest in the viewing audience and they can then be encouraged to learn more. So if you sit down and you watch, whether it be um, a movie about um, Mesoamerica or the Mayans, or whether you were, watch something, a documentary about the Civil War, you're, you're getting kind of just a quick you know, hit of what it was about. But there may be those people in the audiences, and I know there are, that say, oh, well, that was very interesting. I'm going to go ahead and learn more. And so they get on their internet. Maybe they'll take a class in it. And if that's all that television does, then they're successful. And I think that we shouldn't be disappointed in that at all. At least they're talking about it. At least they're trying to say something about history. And it's not just, you know, all this, this you know, fictional stories and, and romances, romance that has no bearing on history whatsoever. I mean, there never used to be a documentary called the History Channel. There never used to be, um, you know, these, these documentaries that really – played on, um, I think, a lot of these historical narratives that, you know, we've, we, we just have, we've always, let me just back up with that, delete that part. But um, I think that today with all these options in cable television or um, the documentaries they make today, we have a lot of opportunities to learn about history and whether it's watching a metal detector show, whether it's, um, whether it's, it's watching um, a documentary on PBS which is a little bit higher. Um, it's it's not it's not a bad thing. I don't think I. It's not always told from to our level of expertise, and there's always things that are left out. But I don't think we should look at television as trying to, uh, or movies as trying to be the end all to be all. You know, that's the reason you have scholars like ourselves writing books, publishing, presenting, because we're the ones that are going to be where you're going to turn to get the whole story. It's not going to be the television show. That makes perfect sense. Um, going through the intro of the book that you, uh, Deadwood had just begun and now that's come and gone. Did you happen to see uh, hell on wheels? Any of that series on AMC? No. Okay. Cause they, uh, they did actually have a diverse cast for one thing and they interacted on various levels. And it's, I just wondered if you'd seen it. Well, I uh, think that that's one thing that should be said about, documentaries or historical um, fiction, the, the things that you see on television shows and movies nowadays is that it's improving. You look at things that were 10 years ago and you see them today and you do see the children running in the streets. You do see the women having roles and you see dialogues between different people and you see different um, uh, ethnicities and people from different ancestral backgrounds being represented. Um, in fact, I, I now today, because I do a lot of African American archaeology and work on slave sites and, and work with African diaspora uh, projects, I specifically watch to see how many people uh, who are of African descent are in commercials that are on shows. I, I watch to see how they're represented because I'll tell you, it's completely changed now. So, what the commercials look like five years ago and what they look like today, uh, the colors are different. Um, it's much more diverse, and there's a movement going on right now. Um, and so what's happening in our own world, in our own society today, is having an effect in what we're seeing on television and in the movies. And um, it's interesting to watch that unfold as someone who's seen it be very, very homogenous and very white and very male to watch that evolution happening over the years because we're in it right now. Yes. Very good. Well, uh, let me ask you just, uh, what have I forgotten to ask you? What, uh, what do you want to put out or what do you want to say? I think the most important takeaway is that uh, archaeologists, when they look at movies and when they look at television series and they try to compare what they produce as you know, books or in, in journal articles or in presentations, 
what they're going to always produce is going to be more accurate. It's going to be more detail oriented than whatever comes out in a documentary, whether it's on PBS or Discovery Channel. It's never going to measure up because they're talking to two different audiences. And I think that's the main thing for people to understand is to like not be so hard on what um, the production companies are trying to put out on the television. Um, they're hitting a certain demographic. Uh, and and they're hurt, they're hitting a specific um, audience and they're giving them what they want. And when we go to our conferences and when we write for our 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 colleagues, we're hitting a, a particular demographic as well. So it's okay that we're hitting different people. And um, but we shouldn't be afraid. I think to go ahead and when the opportunity arises to be in a documentary about a specific. Um, you know, subject matter, whether it be uh, Nazis or whether it be um, something else, uh, we shouldn't be afraid to um, step into that world and to represent archaeology or historians because um, I'll tell you this is that you're going to reach a lot more people um, in that role than you will in your academic role. Okay, very good. I think that went really well. I, I was, like I said, I'm new at this and I appreciate you taking the time and kind of helping me through the questions and uh the links to dr shablitsky's books are in the notes so please check them out